right. Well, second to last Sunday in the year. And today, I would like to introduce you to John Stott, rector of All Souls Church. I believe it's in London. To look that up, but British anyway. Um, <clears throat> one of the probably arguably the most one of the most influential preachers and theological th uh, thinkers yeah, uh, of the early 20th, mid 20th. Yeah, almost the entire 20th century, because I, I believe he passed away in 97. But um, just as a, as a related side note, it's one of those instances where it's best to investigate for yourself what any preacher uh, really preaches, because if you go on Wikipedia, apparently, they have labeled John Stott as a liberal evangelical. Now, that was a great shock to me <laughs> because what I consider a liberal evangelical is not John Stott. And the best way to illustrate that, I think, is to look at one of his sermons. I didn't even go to a whole book, although he has so many. But I pulled up a sermon, a Christmas sermon, that he preached, ooh, must be going on 30 years ago now. Called Love Came Down at Christmas. And the funny thing is, uh, if you read what I pulled up, which is an adaptation from the sermon that's posted on the uh, Billy Graham Association of Canada's website, you would be very puzzled why the sermon had that title. Because it isn't, the, it isn't what the sermon's about. Not really. But then I, I hunted down the actual recording of the sermon and I started to get an idea that someone had given him this topic to speak on, and he had decided to speak on something a little different. <laughs> but I will post a link both to the written, the adaptation on the website and to the recording if you wanna to listen to the entire sermon. But it's based on Luke chapter two, starting in verse eight. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Now, what... Stott does with this passage is focus on the shepherds. And first he talks about the ordinariness 
of these recipients of the angelic annou announcement. He says, you know, <laughs> Jesus wasn't announced to Augustus Caesar or even to Quirinius, who was you know, governor of that time. But he was announced to shepherds, to ordinary, and sometimes you might even say lower class shepherds. And you know, that makes sense because, right, if some visiting dignitary is about to arrive in the United States, they do not generally first announce the arrival to subsistence farmers out in the, <laughs> out in the hills, they, they, they go to important people because you know, important people have people and these people communicate and then the important people can get their business done with each other. But here we have what? The Christ is here to a bunch of shepherds who were despised more or less in their culture, who were almost isolated out in the fields. What an oddity. But this is how God decided to do things. And then he looks at what do the shepherds do? Right? So first thing they do is more like something that happens to them. They are filled with fear. But at the end of this revelation, the angels have gone and the shepherds decide to do something. Let's go see. He talks about this, this sort of spirit of inquiry. It wasn't just that oh, angels have spoken to us. Now let us sit here in quiet for a while and meditate on this message. No, it was, let's go see. And so it, I like the ESV that says they went in haste. I kind of wonder if anyone was left with the sheep or if they even remembered they had sheep at this point. But they, there's a scramble to go to Bethlehem. And if you think about it, and this dawned on me yesterday as I was putting all this together, it was probably a good thing that the inn didn't have any room for them. Because no inn of that time was going to let shepherds straight from the field come visit somebody in one of their rooms. But a stable, they could walk right up to that. They could walk right into that. It was like their home away from home stables. And they go and they see exactly as the angels had said, waiting there for them. He says, the second thing they did after this was go and tell. They made known what had been told them concerning this child. Now, if they thought they were going to have some, you know, private family time in this stable, I expect that this was the end of that. A bunch of shepherds have come. They are crowded in looking at this baby thinking, oh, my word, this is the one they were talking about. And then they go scrambling all over the place to tell people. Angels told us about this baby in this manger. There might have been other people who came to have a look. That's one thing if you're just playing this in a live nativity for a few hours, but if you really are stuck in a stable waiting for your turn to be counted for a census, having people pop their head in and go, ooh, there is a baby in here. <laughs> awkward, just awkward. but they couldn't keep silent. They had to tell. And the third thing he says that they did, they returned, right? They went back. They didn't stay in the, in the stable looking at the baby. They didn't stay running around the town telling people. They went back to their ordinary lives, but 
they returned glorifying and praising God. And Stott points this out as a, a form of transformation. I seriously doubt, personally, that when they first went out to the fields, they had been glorifying and praising God. But now they were. God had stepped down into their commonplace, humble lives, and now they couldn't stop praising him for it. And so he points out, as you go through the story, there are these three stages that they went through. And then he talks about our obligation. When we hear the message of the gospel, that these ought to characterize us as well. And if you listen to the recording, you'll hear that he goes into some detail as a sort of a tangent <clears throat> about how he wishes that there were more of a spirit of inquiry about the gospel, about Jesus, than he normally finds about how people will reject the gospel without even giving it a hearing, without investigating at all. And how that is intellectual dishonesty at the very least. But also more than just inquiry he points out that we are called then to testimony, evangelism, that when we have seen and inquired and found it to be true, the natural reaction should be an overflow of, guess what I saw, guess what I know, guess what I have, that the joy that Christ brings should make the gospel like a wellspring bubbling up within each of us. And I have to say, I found that rather challenging. Because I don't know that I find that to be the case with me often enough. I leave it to you to do your own self-examination to see if it's true of you, but I don't know. But then there's that third stage, right? We have the inquiry first to go and see and the testimony, go and tell. But there's this go back, transformed. That we, then we go our way, but we go our way glorifying and praising God for all we had heard and seen. <clears throat> and if you listen to the recording of the sermon, uh, you will hear how he is urging at this point in time his congregation is handing out copies of the Gospel of Luke. And he has this real call to action at the end that he says, you know, we're giving these out for free under one condition only. And that's that you engage with them, that you read, that you inquire with an open mind. Because, and you can tell that he is convinced that no one will come away from an engagement with the gospel unchanged. And of course, right, we, we've got Christmas coming up this week. 
And of course, for all of us, this is not going to be Christmas as usual. It will be a different sort of Christmas. And I wonder if we make a commitment now to engage with the gospel, if this Christmas will leave us transformed also. We are so easily sucked into business as usual, right? We live life on autopilot so often, but we've been given an opportunity to shake off this automatic way of living, the way things always have been, and maybe to establish some new traditions. Do you normally read the scriptural accounts of the nativity as part of your Christmas tradition? If not, why not try that this year? Do you make what the, uh, what the preachers of old called works of mercy part of your Christmas observance to do good to those who need it the most? If not, maybe try adding that this year. We seek to engage with scripture on a regular basis, particularly in this class. But Stott has a good point. When he gets to the end of his sermon, he talks about how you can go to church, you can read the Bible, you can say your prayers, you can do all of these things but they're all empty without an underlying encounter with Jesus Christ. And we're called to keep seeking him. That's one of his main points in this is that we can't run, like he says, we can't go to, Jerusalem, or to, to Bethlehem and, and find a stable, a baby in a manger. We could go to Bethlehem and get a feel for the ambiance of the you know, landscape and whatnot, but we wouldn't see Jesus there. But where you do see him is in scripture. Do you approach scripture looking for Jesus? seeking to encounter him somehow. It is a challenge. Because like all habits, it's a struggle to develop the habit first, but thereafter it's a struggle from letting the habit become rote, routine kind of a mindless practice that you just do. So I come away with from this, just a single sermon, right? Not even a book. I come away from it with the reminder that we have to be deliberate if we are going to call ourselves Jesus' disciples. Because you know, you've, you've met people who call themselves Christians who are not his disciples. And I pray, first off, that none of us might ever find ourselves in that position. But also that 
we might somehow provide the impetus for others to also take a more deliberate approach to what they believe. Anyway, I, I'll post the links if you want to investigate this sermon. And I also will provide a link to the uh, archive of John Stott sermons if you want to dig a little deeper into what he has to say about various topics, I'll say quite a lot of them. But this is the last preacher we're going to be looking at in this quarter. And I hope that first off, that you have found resources that you can pursue on your own in your own time to strengthen your walk with Christ. And I also hope that you've noticed what is common to all of these whether they are devotional writers, whether they are apologists, whether they are preachers, that the important thing is not brand label. I mean, we've looked at uh, Baptists and Anglicans and Methodists and Presbyterians and all kinds of different labeled believers. But the commonality is, do they point you to Jesus, the biblical historical Jesus, and do they encourage you to engage with scripture more frequently and more deeply? There are no end of uh, people you can listen to on the radio or, or watch on YouTube who want to be spiritual advisors, shall we say, in one way or another. But these two principles ought to be always beside you. Do they point you to the biblical historical Jesus? And do they encourage you to engage with scripture? That way, you don't need to ask somebody else, well, is this a good one to listen to? Or is this one approved? You'll know whether they're approved or not. Does scripture approve them? Right, right alongside with, in the book of Acts, the, the Berean believers who listened to what Paul had to say and then searched through their own copies of the scripture to see if he was telling the truth. Because not everyone who claims to be a signpost to God's kingdom actually is one. And as somebody who's directionally challenged, I know the importance of correct signage. <laughs> you need to know which way you're going. And if somebody starts pointing you in the wrong direction, you need to know not to follow anymore. <laughs> so, like I said, a little short today, but there we have it. We will meet next week, but it'll be something a little different. So I encourage you to join us again then.